we want to talk about microservice services and events, and obviously uh, we had a couple of talks about technology and Elixir, and now we are getting to a couple of talks that actually talk about what people did with the technology and with Elixir. So this is a kind of a description of um, what we have built on top of Elixir over the last three years and a couple of lessons learned. I'm Roland. I'm a builder and runner of functional teams and functional systems, pun intended. My most favorite programming languages are Haskell, Scala, and Elixir. Um, I'm an explorer of extreme digital nomading and remote-first cultures. I write code um, always and everywhere. So this is my digital nomading mobile office. Yeah? So you might find that van somewhere in Europe. Yeah? If you see the van, just knock at the door. I always have cold beer in the fridge and hot tea on the stove. Yeah? So you get a cup of tea or you get a pint. Yeah. Um, so one other thing is um, uh, something that I actually stole from um, Andrea Leopardi is um, every conference needs um, a conference selfie. Yeah? So uh, uh, now we're going to do a conference selfie. And so the, the, the thing is, obviously, we are what, what are we? We are Elixir engineers. What do we want? Types, right? <laughs> yeah, so let's do that. Yeah, so it's going to be, uh, what are we? Elixir engineers. No, let's try that again. What are we? Elixir engineers. Okay. What do we want? Okay, conference selfie done. So now from here it's downwards. So, <laughs> um, so um, uh, three things, stage setting, lessons learned, next step. Uh, stage setting, I will run through the slides really fast, yeah? so, uh, but then I will slow down for the lessons learned. Um, ha, somebody joined and I lost my focus. Now I need to tap this, and then I click on it, ha, and I have my focus back. So what is, um, what is uh, community doing? Um, we are enabling meaningful conversations at scale between our leaders and our members. Um, we do that based on the uh, text messaging network, but there is an innovation that is available now, became available like four or five years ago, where you can do that um, through a new standard, the application to peer standard with 10 digit long codes, not short codes, which creates a very nice um, experience for the members. And that actually enables two-way conversations. Uh, and two-way conversations here is the key. Um, we are not in the business to build the next bigger, better megaphone. We are in the business to build a really good listening um, and hearing aid for our leaders. And we'll talk about the leaders in a minute a little bit more. Um, historically, we started in entertainment with musicians and, and artists, uh, but now we have also kind of branched out into politics and brands. So uh, right now it's US only, but we are expanding internationally probably over the next two years or so, three years. Um, from, a mem uh, from a leader point of view, uh, we have uh, people like Ashton Kutcher on the platform, uh, Ellen DeGeneres on the platform, a couple of other musicians. Uh, we have Justin Trudeau on the platform. We have uh, Stacey Abrams, who is a very famous uh, politician in the United States on the platform, and we have like CNN people, Magazine McDonald's, and a couple of other uh, very interesting names here. Um, one name is not up here, but also on the platform is Barack Obama. And um, if you maybe want to watch the news on 4th of July, there will be another very interesting launch where somebody will start to use community. Yeah, so that's going to happen on 4th of July. Um, so the company is three years old, 2019. Um, we have 100 employees. We have 40 people in product and engineering. We have 20 Elixir engineers. We are 100% remote. We have um, engineers East Coast, West Coast, and in Europe. 
Uh, we have 28 million members, 6 billion messages sent by now, 95% open rate, 59% click-through rate. Um, by all industry standards, normally you look for an open rate between 20 and 30% and uh, like a click-through rate between 2 and 5. So when you look at our numbers, um, there is something working. Yeah? So we are not doing it totally wrong. Um, we have 60 Elixir microservices. We have a TypeScript front end and an iOS app. Yeah? So this is how it looks like. Um, this is the, the web application. And um, this is how our leaders, in this case, it's g Easy, like a rapper. And uh, he, uh, this is how our leaders interact with the communities in their, um, and, their, and, and the members. By the way, uh, just call out, um, sending all of these messages is a challenge on its own. Yeah? We have um, a good grip on that challenge by now. Um, but the real challenge is obviously to process, process all of the, the responses, yeah? and that um, is where the rubber hits the road, so we need to do sentiment analysis, we need to find out is this a, like a positive message, a negative question, is, 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 there, is it a question, then sometimes we cannot figure out anything, then we do clustering and try to find out what's the lowest common denominator maybe in these responses so that the leaders um, can respond um, to the responses in a meaningful way. Uh, that challenge is, at the best, solved half right now. So we have a long way, we are three years into the journey. We have a couple more years to go to really get a grip on this. So uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be fun. So why microservices? Um, not a religious debate here, as pointed out. We started with a monolith, um, as a lot of people. And, um, uh, and maybe the first kind of myth uh, 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 buster here, uh, our services are not necessarily micro. Our services are more um, single purpose. Yeah? But in any case, our services are shared nothing. That's actually the most important thing. It's a shared nothing microservices architecture. And uh, so the journey kind of looks like this for a lot of us. Yeah? And so you start with the monolith, one service, one database, then you start to break up the monolith, but you still have one database. Yeah? And that's actually the elephant in the room. You need to get rid of this. Yeah? That means over time, you need to break up the database so that every service actually owns its own resources. Yeah? The database or the caches. Yeah? So you need to end up in a situation where the services own the resources and not two services are reading or writing from different, um, from different uh, 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 resources here. Uh, the, re the reason why you need to make sure that that is the case is you're looking like for two very interesting advantages out of this microservices uh, thing, and that is first the very famous horizontal scalability so that you can react to business problems like, God forbid, somebody is starting to use your platform. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then you suddenly don't have, uh, uh, you don't have uh, like 5 million members, three months later so you have 10 million members, yeah? and then uh, three months later you have 20 million members. Not that this has happened. Yeah? So, and uh, you want to make sure that you can solve that problem in a manageable uh, way by, let's say, scaling out horizontally. So far so good, but my opinion is the biggest value of microservices has nothing to do with the technology and the horizontal scalability. The biggest value actually is that you can scale the company. It's, you can scale your engineering organization. That's the biggest value. And for that, you need shared nothing. It means the services need to own their own schemas and their own databases and their own resources so that they are really independent and decoupled and loosely coupled. And uh, then you can do what we did. Yeah? So we are. Um, again, um, I'm going to make a couple of very controversial statements. Um, we are not doing the Spotify model. Yeah? So we are doing um, a variation of the Spotify model. We have delivery squads. We also have guilds as the home of the craft for the back end, the front end, and mobile, and so on. But um, um, our, in our case, the delivery squads are the um, uh, is the home of uh, the people management. Yeah? So they all report to the, uh, to the delivery squad leader. So, and that has worked for us in combination with the shared um, nothing microservices architecture to really scale the engineering organization. 
So event-based, um, we get a lot of good stuff out of this. Um, so we have the loosely coupled services to decouple our delivery squads. Everything is honky-dory. Um, it makes the system that we have built um, more resilient, more robust, and more recoverable. Uh, not that we ever had an outage. Um, makes services easier to deploy. M might, uh, let's say, be not um, at the forefront of the thinking here, but um, if you have HTTPS requests, it's not so nice if you, uh, you kind of have to deploy the endpoint first, and then you can start to call it yeah, and can do something with it. Uh, when you have like an event-based architecture with microservices like we do, uh, that entire dependency, uh, let's say, disappears because you can deploy the producer first or the consumer, it doesn't matter. If you, for instance, uh, let's say, deploy the producer first, the events get published and end up in the event store. Sooner or later, somebody might be interested in that event and comes up and you just need to do a replay to catch up with the past and the new service is up and running. Yeah? So everything is much, much easier and you can decouple your engineering uh, uh, work and the, uh, and the projects very nicely. No? Um, we have, uh, with the event-based system, we get a ledger of facts that can be replayed. I will talk about this a little bit more later. And uh, let's see, what also comes out of it is um, because it's not like tangled or entangled, yeah, uh, it's much easier to reason about a subset, um, a subset of the system. So, um, next interesting statement, um, just maybe to take that elephant out of the room, uh, we are not event sourced, yeah? or we are not doing event sourcing, at least I don't think that we do event sourcing. Yeah? And um, um, actually that was a conscious decision up to a certain extent. And when I mean we don't do event sourcing, then I say we don't do event sourcing or CQRS or DDD by the book. Yeah. So we have looked at a lot of stuff and, um, um, and let's say, have decided that for us, um, just in terms of delivering value to the business over these three years, we are just going to pick concepts out of that landscape yeah, and going to adopt it like months by month, quarter by quarter. Yeah? And adopt the concept, deliver value to the business, see how it works, and then do the next better thing. Yeah, and, the next, and the next thing after that. Um, that approach has worked for us. Um, your mileage might vary. Yeah? So, uh, but uh, that's, that's, that's at least what we did. Uh, just in terms of value, one thing that is obviously very nice is the entire concept of materialized views, where you replay the past, yeah, the facts, and uh, you can actually populate data stores uh, for new services, or, God forbid, you have maybe build a service and have picked the wrong technology for the service and you want to switch from maybe a Postgres database to an elastic search cluster and then you can actually do that. The materialized views or this entire concept of having an event store and being able to replay this makes you independent from your past mistakes. Um, so this is the system, high level overview. There is a lot missing to the right hand side um, of the slide here. Um, but uh, the first kind of uh, live stuff here is this is where the majority of the 60 services are living. We have a web and mobile front end. We have an API in the middle. We have live services uh, that run uh, storage. Um, that storage gets frequently updated by the events that come from the event bus. So the services come up, have, uh, have uh, the, the storage replay, and then obviously they start to consume services from the event bus and keep the keep the storage um, uh, in sync. Um, the next thing is we have um, our, uh, let's say, our event subsystem here with the event bus, the archiver, and the event store. Um, and then, uh, very important, we have a message subsystem that actually talks to the carriers, like Verizon, Sprint, um, AT&T, and so on. So that happens there, and this is sending and receiving messages. Um, down here, we have uh, a query engine that actually reads, um, uh, kind of consumes the, the event store and makes it queryable. 
and uh, then it, it's a bridge into our machine learning and a bridge into our business intelligence and business operations. So these two systems are separate. Um, so our production can be down um, and business operations is up, but more importantly, business operations and business intelligence can be down and our, um, our uh, production system is still up. Um, and then comes the replayer here that we use to um, boot new services, and we'll talk about the replayer uh, a little bit later in maybe one more context here where it provides um, additional value, uh, kind of unexpected value. So let's go through this. Um, Elixir on the back end. Um, uh, we also have a little bit of Golang. Yeah? Um, and then we have RapidMQ as the event bus, and we have Protobuf as uh, the schema language to describe uh, the events on the bus. Um, and then we have um, Amazon S3 as, um, uh, as uh, the event store. That's not very sexy, yeah, but it works very well. Yeah? Um, we are cheating a little bit uh, because the archiver um, kind of takes events in and um, then uh, batches them together and writes uh, batches of events to uh, S3 so that we get the throughput, uh, the throughput that we want and need. Um, when I'm talking about this, and um, now we can do a quick test in between just to wake you up again. Test is coming, everybody with me? Okay. And um, so the test is, um, now you have heard me talking about batches, batches of events and so on. And you will hear me talking about that we obviously publish events and we are consuming events from the event bus. Uh, if somebody has paid attention to the last talk, um, I'm wondering what people think what we are using to consume events and eventually, in this case for the archiver, for instance, batching events before we write them to disk. What kind of framework, Elixir framework, can do that naturally great out of the box? Broadway! Broadway! We're not doing another selfie, so... <laughs> Calm down. So, yes, so we have, let's say, we are kind of doing the same thing. We have, we're using Broadway as the framework in our events library to uh, consume events, and uh, we have our own kind of homegrown framework to publish events. Um, so Postgres database uh, is what we use mainly, um, but also others. Uh, the entire infrastructure stuff is uh, Docker, Mesos, and um, uh, uh, Singularity, and AWS. Um, the build system is um, Concourse, and uh, then we have a lot of other stuff. Um, also, we have uh, Athena. Uh, that's the query engine, actually, that we use for the event store. We have Spark to kind of bridge into uh, the machine learning, um, into the machine learning world and into the uh, business intelligence world and uh, basically populate stores over there. Uh, we have a very nice, um, if very nice Vitesse cluster based on MySQL databases for high throughput write operations. Um, that actually works very well if uh, people um, want to try that. And um, we have Elasticsearch and a couple of other things. So let's start to talk about uh, lessons learned. And uh, that the lessons learned come in various shapes. Yeah? Uh, some of them are high level, some of them are a little bit more low level. Um, but um, uh, in no particular order, uh, the first one that I mentioned is uh, we did not go all in on implementing something by the book. We picked concepts one by one and uh, provided value and, and, and gave value back to the business in very small increments and very small iterations. That worked very well, uh, highly recommended. Um, for instance, we initially only um, used facts and events, yeah? so kind of after the fact. So this is how we started. Um, we have now started to also uh, put commands into the system, and basically commands are an expression of an intent. Um, the interesting thing here is from a pattern point of view, um, I, I would call it maybe a guideline that we have uh, discovered and that we are, um, uh, let's say, currently uh, using is uh, that when you start to think about it, then um, events are probably something that gets published by one service 
and consumed by service, many services, many services, and um, and uh, um, and for the commands, it's um, probably the opposite, where lots of people um, basically publish a command um, and. Um, uh, on one service is actually implementing the command. Yeah, so that's uh, maybe a nice pattern uh, that seems to work for us and might also work for you. Um, one thing that uh, we had to do very early on was to solve the problem of how to actually talk about our schemas. And we looked at XML and we looked at JSON and we looked at a couple of other things. Uh, but we, at the end, found the best solution for us, which is Protobuf. Protobuf has a very nice schema language. Uh, Protobuf is available for all of the languages that we are using and has a wonderful Elixir library. Um, uh, and we started to use it three years ago. Um, and uh, at the time, um, we also had to invest a little bit in that uh, 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 protobuf library uh, to optimize um, the usage of the memory and the usage of the CPU for our purposes because we are really encoding and decoding a lot and sometimes big events and big messages. So that had to work um, and then we had to make sure that we can um, kind of work with this um, all over our uh, services landscape. Um, Andrea Leopardi has uh, written a very nice blog post about this, so if you want to learn more about that, just uh, go and read Andrea's uh, blog post. Um, the next thing uh, down the list here is uh, um, an interesting uh, experience. Um, we are using RapidMQ as an event bus, great technology, um, we are, and a RapidMQ is an implementation of the AMQP standard, highly recommended, very sound concepts, really works very well. Um, uh, also, the AMQP library, the AMQP package, the Elixir package works very well. Um, it sums up here. Um, we kind of used it a little bit wrong in the beginning in the sense that we thought that a RapidMQ cluster is actually something that we can use to cluster event types. Yeah? So that we have like an entity event cluster and a message event cluster. Uh, that's not how you use clusters. Clusters are a unit of configuration. If I would do it again today, uh, then I would call that the high availability cluster and the, um, the high throughput cluster. So that's actually the difference between what a cluster is. Yeah? Um, that's not hurting us, it's just named badly and needs to be explained. What hurt us <laughs> was the next thing uh, that we uh, kind of found out, um, and that was 18 months ago, we had um, a, a really bad outage, and that was um, uh, when you read about AMQP and RapidMQ, then uh, what you learn is you publish to an exchange, and uh, then the service comes up, and the service creates a queue, and the queue and you bind the queue to the exchange, and then you're running. Yeah? So far, so good. Uh, what happened 18 months ago was that one of the services got into a bad state yeah? and, started, and, and actually was restarted by Mesos all over again. Yeah? And that restart and constant rebind to the exchange brought the exchange to its knees. Yeah? Uh, it was not able to really deal with these rebinds very gracefully, yeah? at least not in that frequency. And um, so the solution was and is uh, that by now we obviously have um, an event library that is handling all of this for, for the engineers, but in the event library, Broadway-based, uh, we are doing this differently. Um, and what we do is um, the consuming service actually comes up and creates a queue and then creates a service-specific, it looks for a service-specific exchange yeah, and if it's not existing, it creates one, and then binds the queue to that exchange. Yeah? So that means if this would ever go wrong, then we would overwhelm the service exchange, but not the event bus main exchange. Yeah? So that means the rest of the system actually stays up and running. Yeah? So that was uh, something uh, that we had to learn the hard way, uh, but it works, it works well today. Um, next one is... Um, 
Uh, when you do event-based systems, uh, there are like a uh, couple of elephants in the room. One of the elephants is uh, um, you, let's say, want to make sure that uh, you are, let's say, not losing events, and then you are looking for something like exactly one semantics. And don't mention the war. Let's not talk about two-phase commit. Yeah? So um, that's a bad idea. Yeah? So the next better thing that you can do, and that is actually uh, easier to implement, is uh, obviously um, um, uh, is obviously at least once, uh, at least once, um, is much easier to implement. At most once is even easier to implement, but um, you run the risk to lose events, uh, which is not a good idea because then your eventual consistency goes out of the door. Yeah? So we are doing uh, at least once uh, as a message semantic, and uh, um, people have, have probably seen that picture 10,000 times. To do something like this, you have to handle the events on the publisher and the uh, consumer side slightly different. On the publisher side, you first publish and you wait for the confirmation, um, if, as it's called in, uh, in uh, AMQP, and then you do something to the database. Um, then on the and the data, uh, you do something to the database, and the event bus has its own store. So as soon as you get back the confirmation, the event is safe. So then you do the database. On the consuming side, you have to do it the other way around. You first consume the event. You then update the database. And when that is done, you basically acknowledge that you have received the event. And everything is honky-dory with one small problem. The small problem here is obviously if this fails at the wrong time, you end up with events coming twice or three times or four times. Let's talk about that in a minute a little bit more. Um, so, uh, then the question was, uh, how can we operate this? Yeah? And one good idea was, uh, um, we were obviously doing replays for reasons. But then, let's say, at the end we decided, um, why don't we do a replay of the last 24 hours every day? Yeah? And we do that every morning at 10, 15 GMT, yeah? when half of the Americans are sleeping. And uh, that replay takes about 45 minutes to an hour, yeah? and we kind of flood the system with the events of the last 24 hours. Yeah? And with that, we can actually make sure that the event store is up and running and um, is, uh, is consistent, uh, is available and consistent, and then we can make sure that the system can actually deal with um, the duplicate events and we have, that we have not overlooked that one service cannot digest certain event types. Um, and there is uh, one more thing, um, if there is a bug somewhere and we have maybe dropped an event uh, for buggy reasons, uh, then we can use that to kind of uh, get everybody back to normal and uh, heal the system, um, uh, let's say, automatically on the fly. So that's, uh, that uh, is actually working now for six months and uh, has proven to be very, very, uh, very, very valuable. No? Um, that's probably more like I'm preaching to the choir here with this. Um, it's a, a very expected, unexpected side effect yeah, that has nothing to do with the software engineering side of things. It's more that um, um, from an operations point of view, um, uh, the event store is fantastic for, anal for, to, for to analyze what happened. Yeah? An HTTP request is done and gone. Yeah? We can look into the event store and can say what events were on the bus for the last 10 minutes, what happened here? Yeah? And um, can figure out what happened and then we can also do repair afterwards. Yeah? So very valuable, uh, very valuable in, that, uh, in that regard. Yeah? So last uh, kind of slide uh, here, or second to last slide. Um, so now we need to think about how to do this uh, item potent thing uh, to make sure that the services can actually deal with the duplicates and can deal with out of order events that can also happen. Yeah? And uh, um, what we do is um, we don't do, for instance, inserts into the database. Uh, we always do upserts. And um, that works based on a timestamp, and there is one timestamp in the database, and there is one timestamp in the event. Yeah? And when we replay, these upserts obviously create a lot of unnecessary reads, because before we write 
yeah, um, uh, uh, let's say the absurd statement, yeah, the, 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 uh, will actually read the data first. It might not write afterwards, but it will read first. Yeah. And um, uh, so that's an overhead um, that we are accepting right now. And it's not, uh, let's say, un let's say it's uh, not that it's hurting us. So it, it works for us. Um, one other thing is to make that work, uh, we obviously need to have tombstone records in the database so that we can always get the timestamp of the last event that was um, put into the database for that service, for that service. Um, so that works. Um, now comes a little bit of, uh, of uh, dirty laundry. Um, um, dirty laundry, um, first is um, when you read about event sourcing and you read about DDD, yeah, then you will find blog posts that basically say, oh, 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 uh, never ever do um, like CRUD uh, events along the lines of create entity, update entity, delete entity, don't do that. Yeah? So, and that's exactly what we did. Yeah? Um, it's uh, very comprehensible. Yeah? You can explain it to people fast and um, let's say it's good enough for us right now. Um, one thing that we got wrong was that initially we thought that we need to optimize. Uh, who has ever heard about premature optimization? So we thought that we need to optimize for very large events with very small updates and came up with the wonderful idea to do deltas, yeah? uh, like delta updates. And um, that actually proved to be a bad idea yeah, because these delta updates need to be really in order. Yeah? Otherwise, you cannot figure out um, what the actual state is right now. The solution for us was six months ago, 12 months ago, we retired the entire delta thing. And now we only have absolute updates, it means the update has the complete event in it. Yeah? And then we are back to the timestamp upsurge and can just write the event with the oldest, oldest timestamp. Uh, time yeah? So that will, uh, that will always work. One other small thing, we started with milliseconds, another bad idea, uh, that was not enough precision. So we had to kind of update everything to microseconds. That, since then, everything is honky-dory. Um, another small detail, if you do the upsurge and you do that for Redis, um, when you use the Redis uh, driver or the Redis package, the Elixir package, uh, you can obviously do reads and you, do, you can do writes, uh, but you cannot do it in one transaction. So that means uh, for kind of upsurge that we need to do on a Redis cache, uh, we need to do Lua's scripts. Yeah? But uh, uh, that's, I think, uh, acceptable. So what's the next step here? A uh, couple of quick next steps is, one is we have um, actually, uh, we want to use uh, uh, intents and commands uh, all over the system, want to get, uh, want to get that rolled out. We have a, a very simple like XRPC implementation where we are sending an event and also getting an event back from a service like request response. Um, we will actually keep that and we'll keep it for rapid prototyping uh, so that in a rapid prototyping situation where we sometimes do not really know how the command needs to look like yet, yeah, um, so that we don't need to create a command schema. Yeah? So um, we, we're going to keep that, and as soon as we have figured out what works and how it needs to look like, then we will turn that into a command and we'll retire the XRPC implementation of, uh, of the prototype. Um, then let's say we need to get the Golang support up to par with the Elixir support that we have. That's going to uh, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, sooner or later, we need to introduce snapshots so that we don't need to replay um, everything from scratch. That's not a problem right now because our replays are either by event type or over a period of time. So we never ever in the last three years had the need to replay the entire event store since the beginning of time over all event types. That has never happened. No. Um, we want to continue to invest in consistency on top of the, um, in top of the, the daily replays. And uh, sooner or later, uh, we need to take a look at versioning. 
Um, uh, Protobuf is very nice uh, in the sense that um, you can obviously add to the schema on the fly, and the old services on the old schema will continue to work and will just ignore the additional fields. Yeah? And that has served us well. There are obviously edge cases of versioning where uh, sooner or later we need to uh, maybe come up with more sophisticated solutions. So the question was uh, microservices and events, friends or foes? And uh, for us, the answer, as you might guess by now, is best <laughs> buddies ever. Yeah. So uh, we want both. We need both. And in our case, they love each other. Yeah? And with that, uh, thanks for your attention. And any questions? Thank you, Mario. Uh, I can see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions, please. How many events you actually process every single day? Sorry, come again? How many events you process? What's your volumes? The workload. Yeah, workload, volumes. Yeah. yeah, so the workload obviously goes up and down over the course of the day. Yeah. And, um, um, and then it also is a question of uh, who is, um, uh, let's say, for instance, sending out a campaign. So we have, for instance, uh, um, one of the YouTubers that we have on the platform has like over one million members. Yeah? And uh, so if that goes out, there is a spike in the system. Yeah? Um, the interesting thing is our platform can do 10,000 events a second. Yeah? But we have to throttle that because the carriers can only take a thousand messages a second. <laughs> yeah? So we have to throttle down the sending. Yeah? And uh, from a receiving point of view, um, that is kind of triggered by the size of the campaign. And, um, um, and uh, it's also triggered by um, uh, how fast a human being can type. Um, so I would say that in and out, um, let's say we have, uh, let's say in and out, we have between 1,000 and 2,000 messages per second. No? At did, peak. That, did that answer your question? Yeah, I just meant to the volume. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question from uh, Yuan Barrios, who's on uh, virtual. Are you there, Yuan? Hello. Try unmuting yourself. Uh, is he there? <laughs> the suspense. Um, shall I ask the question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so his, his question is, where is Golang helping the system over similar implement, implementation? In ha! MHC? That's, uh, I was waiting for that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, the short answer is uh, that we have um, um, a couple of very small tasks. Yeah? Um, for instance, we have one task where we do need to do link shortening. Yeah? And um, so we, uh, at that point in time, we started to experiment um, if uh, maybe Golang can give us, um, and, and that, let's say, service, uh, let's say, needs to do link shortening actually not once per message, but for after the fan out, because we are also putting um, the link tracking into that link shortening. Yeah? So that needs to be high throughput. Yeah? And we just were experimenting uh, how will Golang will perform in that scenario. Yeah? And uh, so it works well, worked well, is uh, not using a lot of resources and is delivering on the throughput requirements. So we kind of kept it. And then there is always a factor here, a little bit of a factor here, where um, sometimes people have a preference a language preference, yeah, and uh, so sometimes people uh, are, let's say, using Elixir or Elixir uh, uh, engineers, and then they will solve the problem in Elixir. And we also have uh, a couple of people who have a Go background, and though then they tend to solve the problem in Go. Yeah, so it's a half um, like a technical requirements thing, yeah, but in a lot of other cases, it's just a language preference thing. I've got a question from Akash Khan. A 
Cash. Hello. Ah, ah, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. So thank. Yeah. I thanks for the talk. Yeah. I really liked it. Uh, so my question is that you mentioned that your services uh, follow a no shared DB architecture. Uh, so how did you set up analytics and BI uh, for such services, considering that analytics usually requires an aggregate of all the data coming through the system and so on? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, then uh, I repeat the question just to make sure that I understood the question right. Uh, the question was um, um, that um, I mentioned that there is uh, business intelligence um, on the kind of receiving side here on the other side. And um, uh, the question was how, how do we set up uh, kind of the, the databases and the data stores for the business intelligence side? And that means um, uh, actually that a complete kind of copy yeah, of the event store gets constantly st streamed into our data lake house, you know, into our data lake. And then from there we are doing um, actually certain views that are suitable for finance, that are suitable for product, uh, that are suitable for all of the consumers. Yeah? So we kind of uh, stream that into the lake and then from there we are building views that are suitable for, for, business, intelligence, uh, for business intelligence problems. Oh, so uh, you mean uh, the services have a share, they have their own DB as, and they share, and they send the, the analytics data to this shared warehouse. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. so the, 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 the services have their own database, but the business intelligence side is actually based on a like separate data lake that gets uh, populated constantly, populated and updated. Uh, let's say through uh, through the uh, out of the event store and out of the out of the event bus. Understand. Thanks. Hi, uh, Christian here. Thank you for the talk. Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, in this uh, world, kind of. Um, Rainbowish world of based on events, uh, which I kind of love. Uh, how do you manage to get the client notified from a kind of a synchronous operation to be terminated? So in order that he can refresh the UI by making another call and refreshing the resource. Uh, uh, I mean, how, how do you manage to get a client notified that an asynchronous operation has terminated? Ah. So okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so. Um, uh, good question. Um, so right now, um, so 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 right now, uh, not so well. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, what might happen is um, uh, so. What happens is there is a uh, there is a backend for front end service, a BFF. Yeah. And that is kind of owning the the synchronous communication with all of the clients, which is not so nice. Yeah. So sooner or later, we obviously would love to maybe even use webhooks yeah, and get that end-to-end -end done. But that's not how it works today. So there is a BFF in between, a backend for front-end service that is actually synchronizing this. Uh, okay, there's one, one last question. I'll ask it just because we've run, out, we've run over time. Um, but how, how do you throttle uh, messages? Or how do you control the, the flow of messages? Um, so uh, we, uh, let's say, so, uh, uh, so first we are using, uh, from the consuming side, uh, we are obviously using all of the goodness that is in Broadway, yeah? So that's on the, on the consuming side. On the carrier side, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, yeah? Because uh, the carriers uh, have certain requirements that we need to honor uh, per leader and sometimes per carrier, so we have a homegrown um, system that um, throttles the traffic, uh, let's say, that uh, with the carriers. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, last round of applause for Roland, please. Thank you. Great talk.